Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Plant Services Tool Belt Podcast. Uh, I'm really excited for this episode today because my guest today, he is not your traditional specialist in plant maintenance. It is Lee Kitchen, and he has 32 years of experience at the Walt Disney Corporation across multiple roles, including the very specific role of Innovation Catalyst. Um, we'll talk to Lee about that role, but in that role, um, one of the things that Lee did was he trained groups within Disney on the design thinking process, and he conducted many, many idea sessions across the company. He branched out from Disney about five years ago to found his business, Magical Dude Consulting, and you can find that Lee Kitchen on LinkedIn, and his business is also listed there. His passions include new and innovative things that inspire people and DJing eclectic music, uh, both of which come to life in these ongoing live streams on Twitch. Uh, the first one is called Inspiration Report, and that is comes out the first Friday of every month. Uh, specifically, the next one for us is June 3rd. And also Beat Party Magic, which is his weekly live DJ dance party from 9 to 11 p.m. Uh, both of these are on his Twitch channel, and I'll put the links in the podcast notes, but that's twitch.tv slash L-E-E-B-E-E-X-L-T, which I love. Uh, <laughs> one, one last thing, Lee. Um, Lee and I met in early May 2002. 20, 2022 at the Leading Reliability Conference in Clearwater, Florida, where Lee delivered the opening keynote, and he spoke about the elements of success when it comes to new idea development. It requires collaboration, inspiration, and cultivation. So, who that's a big intro, Lee. Thank that's a great so intro, man. I want to take you along everywhere. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. It's like, by the book, awesome. Thank you, Tom. Really great. Oh, no, I'm really excited to talk with you today. This is great. Uh, and we get to continue our conversation that we started uh, last week at the Leading Reliability Show. Yeah, so. it was. Uh, I had I had a blast there. You know, I, anytime I go into a keynote like that, especially in a business that I don't know a whole lot about, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous because I don't know how I'll be received. But I think that in the audience, there was a lot of people there who, who think or who know they're creative, but on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not, you know, they don't, uh, people don't tell them that they're creative, but they, they save the business, you know, so they have to come up with ideas all the time. So I, it was really nice to, to chat with some of the people uh, after the session, because I think, I think some of the principles that I was talking about really kind of hit home with them. You really did leave an impact. Yeah. Every now and then at the following session, people would say, oh, that's kind of what Lee was saying about how to socialize your message and how to, yeah. how to celebrate the wins. Yeah. You left, yep. it's a real mark. Um, well, let's start the podcast uh, with a question about you and your work. Could you tell us a bit more about yourself, what you do, uh, what what some of the projects you, you worked on? Sure, sure. So I was basically a Disney lifer. So I ever since I was six years old, I dreamed about working for Walt Disney World. I grew up in Northern California. And when I, uh, when, when I was in 1985, actually, date you how old I am, um, I turned 18, I graduated high school, and I moved to Florida, like, and all in the same three-day period. And wow. when I started work at um, Epcot, it was actually the Land Pavilion. You, uh, I, I told you I started the Kitchen Cabaret, which is a classic attraction. It's now where yeah. uh, it's, it's no longer there. It's soaring is where in its place now. Long live um, but you know, I, I had fulfilled my lifelong dream at 18, and... And man, what is it? It was such a great ride. I started in operations, just helping people on the rides and attractions. I got to be a guest relations tour guy, which means I hosted, you know, all of, I hosted all of like my favorite celebrities, including Van Halen and Duran Duran and things like that. Just basically <laughs> riding rides and eating at restaurants for a living for four years. It was awesome. <laughs> and then uh, I took that uh, into a professional capacity and I started my job in marketing um, in the early 90s and then marketing went through uh, Disney marketing went through kind of a renaissance where they started thinking about it more as brands so they started basically kind of following a Procter & Gamble model of, of branding so I was one of the first cast members on the brand management team uh, brand management strategy, strategy and events team so I got to start events like the Epcot Food and Wine Festival it was like like I was at the very first year very beginning of that which was an awesome thing to do I helped with the Millennium Celebration and then I was selected to be a brand manager for Disney Cruise Line. And I'm not quite sure if you experienced that brand before, but it's basically your love for Disney plus the luxury of a, of a cruise ship uh, plus a, an amazing setting. And it's such a great product. And I loved working there because every single person I worked with was just as passionate as I was about the brand. And so... And I got to sail 120 times, so oh my <laughs> definitely gosh. not complain. Yeah, it was a tough <laughs> gig, right? Having the cruise ship as my work backdrop. Uh, but then from there, I went to um, to start this this job as an innovation catalyst, and the job was advertised as 
we need someone to help us come up with ideas. So I thought they were hiring me because I, I love being an ideator and I love creating ideas, right? Well, no, they hired me so I could facilitate other people to come up with ideas. I had no idea how to facilitate at the time. I was totally making that stuff up. Mm -hmm. But And actually, they kind of were as well. But um, a couple years in, they actually got serious about it. They hired us a, a vice president, and then he hired a company from Accenture called What If. And What If taught us this, this amazing um, uh, design thinking system. We called it the Toy Box at the time. But it was kind of my first introduction into design thinking. And then I joined this awesome creativity community where I, I uh, would share best practices with other people who do the same thing. And man, it just grew you know, my toolbox of awesome stuff, not only with the stuff I learned at Disney, but also with uh, uh, the creativity community. So after I left Disney in 2017, I, I took this, this niche talent and I figured there's a lot of companies that don't have people like me on their roster. So <laughs> I was instantly popular with those companies because they needed someone to lead idea sessions. They needed somebody to teach them to be more innovative and creative. So I, I've been in business now for five years and they say, once you reach the five year mark, you're doing good. So I feel good about that. <laughs> oh, that's, that is awesome. Congratulations on the business. And yeah, uh, thanks man. Thank you. You got a lot of people who are listening right now who are nodding their heads to a bunch of things you said. Uh, first off, you know, we, we have a lot of folks in the maintenance and reliability field who transition from one to the other. Oftentimes they'll go to sleep on Friday and maintenance tech and they'll wake up and there'll be reliability on Monday. And the company is not sure what that means, uh, but they know they need someone who wants who, who's to be put in charge of more proactive uh, work right. management, you know? Um, well, let me, let's focus right away on something that was central to your message at uh, during the keynote, which is why it's so important to recognize that we are all creative people. Uh, that's something which I did hear definitely also repeated Absolutely. over the week. Uh, what you really drove that home in an inspiring way. You know, the field of industrial asset management, our core readership, it's full of people who like to solve problems. They wouldn't have gotten into engineering if they didn't like right. <laughs> solving these kind of problems. Um, yet these workers, they faced a couple different challenges. Number one, they only occasionally get credit for demonstrating that quality. Um, yeah. You know, they, they can get ground down when it comes to, okay, you do your routes in the machines, you check the condition, and there's not a whole lot of room for creative thinking. You sort of follow the instructions. Yeah. Um, Plus, it's probably reactive a lot, too. When things break down, they have to be there to help, right? Yeah. That's it. And, yeah. and people who want to move out in front of that reactive mode often get stifled because it's tough yeah. to get time on the machine sometimes when, when production rules and output is king. Uh, so general question, what would you say to those teams in order to keep them inspired while helping them message better with other people in the organization about their own creativity? Yeah, I think a lot of times when people equate creativity they equate it to people who have creative in their title so if you don't you're not a creative art director or a creative writer or whatever it is then you're not creative well of course everybody in the organization is creative i you you heard me say that my finance manager was the one of the most creative people on you know in my realm because they would always figure out what to do with that budget by the end of the year really creatively right that's right so that's right. i think it's just um you know i talked a little bit about um about uh competence and structure so Creativity is, you have to exercise it, it's, it's a muscle. And so when you think about those, like in marketing, they're exercising that every day. They have to come up with ideas for ads and things like that on a daily basis. So I think just having the mindset of, hey, I have to start with creativity, um, but I wanna add to it by, by collaborating together, I think would be a good message for, for them because they do have to work, you guys have to partner with different, different styles of people throughout the day, like, like people who do different things. And mm -hmm. I think that partnership um, and that collaboration leads to that next big idea always. So instead of, I, I, I wish in my, my, my mind's eye, I wish it was more of a collaborative effort where, where they kind of work together saying, hey, we have to do this, you have to do this, how can we, how, how might we make sure it's best for both of us kind of thing? So I would say keep exercising that creativity, keep practicing it. Um, you know, I talked a lot about fresh input, going outside your realm and outside your organization is really important just to see how other people are, are solving challenges. Mm. Um, but again, collaborating with those closest to the problem is, is, is important, right? It's an important part of the step. It's not just me and you, it's us doing this, right? It's we. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, a couple of times uh, sessions later in the week, people joked about the fact that maintenance and operations often goes head to head. And, yeah. and at one point, uh, I think it was Sean uh, when he was presenting, Sean Eisenhower, he asked everyone yeah. in the room, raise your hand if you're in maintenance and about half the hands went up. Yep. Uh, raise your hand if you're in reliability, more hands went up. Raise your hand if you're in operations. 
one hand in the whole room. <laughs> right. And everyone kind of, everyone kind of chuckled because we're like, well, that's part of the problem, right? Is that you get isolated, you go to these very specific conferences. Yep. And yeah, sometimes people you have to talk to are the ones who aren't in the room <laughs> when yeah. these sessions are going on. <laughs> yeah, I found, I found when I would host Brainstorm specifically, um, I would want to make sure that whatever we were seeking to solve. So in my realm, it was a market marketing situation, but still marketing mm -hmm. affects the operations team. It affects the merchandise team. It affects the custodial team. So I would invite a representative from those teams to join us, even though marketing wasn't their expertise. I wanted them early on to have a stake in what we were doing because when it comes time for, like I told you about a principle called assisters or resistors, right? Mm -hmm. So I like to invite those resistors early on because I want them to have a, a, a piece of it, have a stake in it. So they have a little bit of ownership to it when it goes live and when we do it. So there's yeah. nothing worse than coming up with an idea in isolation and then going to your legal team and your HR team afterwards because they're most likely don't understand how we got there. And so the first thing they're going to do is try to poke holes in it. So right. I say let's involve those people early on because, again, they will help collaborate with you. And when it comes time for execution, they will they will own it more and they will they will become those assisters to help you bring that idea to life. That's and it. I know it's it's probably difficult in your in that environment, but you know, there's probably standard meetings where those teams get together. Let's set aside time just for hey, this problem might come up. Let's talk about solving it now before we get to the reactive part of it, right? Let's and let's do that part together and yeah. and and have input on it together. I know, I know that sounds like kind of an ideal situation, but you know, you can always seek for the best, right? Yeah, well, it, it's funny. I've heard stories from people in maintenance who have reached out to the finance teams. You mentioned the finance person was in the meeting. Finance is weirdly, oftentimes, reliability people's best friend because finance knows the exact cost of being exposed to greater risk. And yes, so right. when, when people are, are looking at the, the, uh, the industrial assets, they're trying to figure out what is the risk potential of letting this operate two more months, Correct. four more months without certain work. Finance can help them out and say, okay, it, you, let's quantify yeah. the risk. And you can't argue with facts. And that's why I, I always talk about um, how important it's just a, a step before you get to ideation in the design thinking realm is called empathy, right? Mm -hmm. It's walking in your end users and your consumer shoes. And what I always tell my groups when we're working on this is um, trust facts over assumption. You can make intuition later, but exhaust all the facts you have because it's hard to argue with data. So mm -hmm. everybody has an assumption about what's going to happen when that critical moment happens. But if somebody in your organization has data that shows, hey, actually, that's not going to happen. Here's here's how we see it. So we do have an opportunity here. That's mm -hmm. a great. That's a beautiful thing. But the, the the trick of that is, Tom, is everybody has to have that that aha moment together. So mm. again, do it as a collaborative group. Get that get that data. Throw it out on the table. Make connections with it and decide together. Well, the data is showing us this, so we should proceed this mm -hmm. way. And that way, we again, we all agree on it. We all have those epiphany moments. We had a great consumer insights team at Disney and they were at one time they wanted to be the gurus of information. So they held it close to their chest and it was just like, well, wait a minute, these people that are working on it, we need to be inspired too. So let us, let us go along a little of that journey with you. And yeah. we found after we talked them into that, that the project came out, the end product came out richer because they had the inspiration too. So, and, and people laugh at me because they say, how can data be inspiring? I'm like, Dude, sometimes you learn something you didn't already know and you had this huge assumption about it and it totally debunks your assumption. And you're like, wow, the possibilities just open up when you found that out. So mm -hmm. I, I say trust the data, um, use your intuition if you have to, but don't just rely on assumptions and do it together, right? Yeah, no, that, that's excellent points all around, um, especially not holding all your ideas and data close to the vest. I mean, <laughs> yeah. The, People who do that, they may have tribal knowledge, but I find that those who share effectively, suddenly they, they don't give their power up, suddenly because they become leaders, they have to become more powerful. Yeah, I found that I found that I did a lot of sessions where I basically had to throw things over the fence. So I never saw a lot of the things that I helped brainstorm until three or four years later, I'm like, oh, there's Disney's Magical Express. Oh, there's Fast Pass. there's all this stuff. Wow. And yeah, I knew I had a part in it, but I had to let go early because I wasn't really an owner of it. There was another group that was going to be an owner, but I felt good enough that I was part of the process. Um, so I think letting go has a lot to do with it too, knowing that the world is still going to be a better place because you had that influence. 
Um, I know that it's it's a tough gig, especially when our salaries rely on it. So a lot of folks that I worked in Yellow Shoes, those art directors, when they came up with a big idea, they were compensated for it, right? They, they got bonuses and things like that. So it was hard for them to share their ideas because of that. But I still think the quality of all of our work will be better if we if we collaborate together, right? Right. You know, Lee, another point you made during your keynote also stood out to me, which is the point of the pitching part of ideas is really important. Uh, I'm a recovering gifted kid who was really good at school. (laughs) And I kind of had to figure out how to be good at the rest of life, too. And I always figured, you know, isn't the answer enough? And the answer is no. It's just one of those lessons, solving the immediate problem, fixing the machine. That's only part of the process. Absolutely. The, the best, most effective solutions also involve the pitch, inviting others to share your vision. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how that works. Yeah, I was really passionate about this. Specifically in my last couple of years at Disney, I worked for the Yellow Shoes Creative Group, which was um, the advertising arm of Disney. And we, we were responsible for advertising Disney parks around the world. And it was the structure of it was basically there was a guru senior leader, right? And we were all kind of bowed to the guru senior leader and they expelled their opinions on stuff. And and what what really floored me sometimes is a lot of art directors who usually led the process would go in on the day of the pitch and after we had worked three months on something, right? It was just like we did a lot of empathy work. We we got people together for ideation sessions. We finally came to the stuff. And the first thing that they would do was self-deprecate the ideas and be like, well, these aren't really the best compared to whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, we just, we just spent three months working on this. So I'm a really big passionate person on that. That pitch is so important because you just spent a lot of time, right? And you spent a lot of effort and why would you fall short at the very end of the process on that? So I, I think people should put uh, and I always compare it to the Shark Tank. You you pitch this like your life depends on it, no matter how big or small it is. Um, but the other important thing is, I in, through my creativity training, um, there's a principle that talks about how people have different learning styles. And um, I think they've kind of debunked the, the original part of it, but the principle of it is still good. So people like receiving information auditorily, like uh, sounds, like when you're you're reading and things are in reading text uh, mm-hmm. visually. So you like seeing charts and pictures and things like that and um, kinesthetically, which means you have to see and touch and things like that. So what I say is most important is when you're pitching is to make sure that you realize that your audience all has different styles. So don't just stop Mm. at showing one graph or Excel spreadsheet or a chart. You need to tell, tell the story and the story, you know, we're all connected through storytelling throughout history, right? So telling a story is a really um, key part of that. And, and bringing your audience in that you're pitching to basically try to put them in the end user shoes, right? So I, I don't know if I told the story at the, um, at the um, session last week, but I, I talk about how the founders of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, um, the, the first British version, they were selling it to the producers. And in order to really bring it to life for them, they actually went and withdrew $10,000 or 10,000 pounds and laid it on the table and actually played the game and moved the money to the person for each stage of the game. And so they like, put them in the pressure, like, here's all this money and you're going to possibly win it. And so they really brought it to life with their folks. So I, I tell people, think about ways to bring your your stuff to life beyond words. Mm-hmm. And, and again, don't skimp on that story because it's really important. If it doesn't work for some reason, though, I say there's no bad idea, just bad timing, right? So Mm -hmm. I I, I told you the example about the Star Wars Intergalactic Food and Wine Festival. My boss and I, we tried to pitch that at least 10 times to different leadership. Every time the leadership (laughs) would change, we'd pitch it again. We didn't know that they were busy building Star Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, so we Mm -hmm. we were unknown to that. But um, but yeah, there's always a good time for another idea some other time if it doesn't work. And I say just put them, put them in the hopper. So uh, I guess my, my message there is get the, keep your story telling game high and don't don't skimp. Make sure that you really, really bring that to life at the end because that's a lot of work, right? You don't want to let right. that work slide. And if it doesn't work, yes, it's a nice failure to put under your belt to learn for later. But, man, it's just, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough gig working that hard on a project and then, and then not pitching it right, you know? Right. <laughs> Right. You know, and, and to analogize it to uh, some of the folks I've talked to in maintenance, it's, you know, learning the new technology, for example, learning how to use an ultrasound probe and you finally find a fault in a bearing and you know the bearing is going to go bad in about two months. Well, it's not enough just to report that you found X, Y, Z. As you, as you just said, tell the story, 
right? Explain what happened. Yep. Explain what the technology is bringing to the situation. Uh, bring what you just did to life for people. Yeah. If, if especially if you're meeting some resistance, and people don't want to listen to it because that's that's <laughs> a, that's the kind of work. Like you said, it, it, if you do, if you've done the work and the action, it, it, there's no resulting action. Then was the work even done? You know, yeah. that's it. yeah. The fun thing that I would do um, to disarm executives specifically is instead of pitching at a conference table, because you know when you sit behind a conference table. It's where decisions get made, right? It's like everybody's like, it's like the gavel kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I would purposely get them out of that space and I would walk the walls with them. And I wouldn't present the, I wouldn't present the actual end thing first. I would start with the story on how we got there mm -hmm. and I would bring them along the story. So by the time we got to the idea or the solution, they were already bought in because we justified it based on consumer data and based on uh, the places that we went for ideation and based on how we developed it. I found that adoption and basically saying yes to ideas was much, much easier once they had that story. And again, I had them stood up and walking the walls. So there wasn't time to sit down behind a desk. It was like, we're all in all, all throughout the way. And what I also found is that they would, they would build, they wouldn't automatically say no, they would build and say yes, they would do the yes and more to build mm -hmm. the idea even stronger. So that's one suggestion I would make is, is wow. get people out of that conference room setting. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear some more stories from your Disney career too. You know, a uh, uh, 30 plus year career. You and I are both fans of Epcot from the eighties. Like you said, I, I miss the kitchen cabaret. I, oh, miss, yeah. I miss horizons. I even miss the Exxon ride. Uh, <laughs> Universe it, of energy worked there too. Yeah. I'm telling you what, Tom, I, I could not wait. I was actually doing another podcast yesterday. We were talking about this. I could not wait to get there to wear the polyester outfits. There, <laughs> there, you know, because I was also a huge Star Wars and Star Trek fan. Star Trek specifically, you know, uh -huh. they wore those slick uniforms. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember I wore this outfit that was affectionately known as the potato sack. And it was a tunic that had a little gray belt. It's what we wore if you, if you went in between um, Horizons and... Uh, um, uh, the General Motors exhibit. I'm forgetting what it was called at the time. Oh, Communicore East, Communicore West? No, uh, it was a predecessor to, to Test Track. Um, oh, I, I think, World of Motion. I, World of Motion. Yeah, World of Motion. Yes, yes. And also, we wore them when we worked at World Key Information, which was the direct video um, yes. re reservation system. Yes. And I loved wearing that outfit. Everybody else hated that outfit, uh, and I absolutely <laughs> loved it. I don't know why. But yeah, I, you know, I, I was a really lucky person. I had some, not only did I work, uh, at some really great places, but I was lucky enough to work with some of the best leaders and people at Disney. And when I left, I don't, I don't miss the day-to-day -day po political stuff, but I definitely miss the people that I worked with. There was mostly, you know, I'd say 65 to 75 percent of the people that I worked with were as passionate as I was about that product. And wow. and it's, I, I don't know about you, but when you work for people that really love their jobs, it's such a better environment to work in, right? Nobody's wow. complaining that you don't have the naysayers and, and it's it's just a, a, a total pleasure. So uh, I love doing that. But as far as the, the, my tour guide years, I will never forget them because like I said, I was wearing a plaid vest and helping people on rides. There was one tour where I was basically kind of a, um, it was, it was a rich guy who owned a shipping line and he had meetings all week and he wanted me to entertain his teenage kids. So we played video games and rode the little boats and ate hamburgers all week long. I That's had, big, I had a, I had a tour with Rick Dees. If you remember Rick Dees, Casey, yeah, Casey, Disco Rick Duck. Dees. Yeah, Rick, Rick Dees would broadcast from there in the morning, but he didn't want to go to the park, so all we did was play golf. So I basically played golf for a living all week long. Wow, <laughs> it was a it was wow. a really great gig. And when I hit the when I hit the marketing uh, area, it was um, it was just nice to be involved in. I mean, I was involved in a lot of great events. The Millennium event was one of the biggest best things that I had done at the time, and what we pulled off for that with Tapestry of Nations and Illuminations mm -hmm. and. It was just so cool to be a part of that because that we had the most people we'd ever had in Epcot, like eighty-five to ninety thousand people in the park, and everybody was just happy and getting along, and it, it was just such a great thing to be a part of. And and uh, I, I uh, the, the that next decade I was involved in um, I was involved in opening the Hong Kong park, which was amazing. I spent three months over there helping them train uh, design thinking. I went to I was part of the opening team for Shanghai Disneyland, wow. and everything caved in there. We we didn't have enough resources to do what we needed to do, but man, we pulled that off. And I don't know if if you are a big Disney fan, but if you ever see a special event at Disney, there is this group of people in the background. 
that are working feverishly to get this thing done. And like you said, it's operations and it's marketing and it's people who don't normally work together or don't normally see eye to eye all having to, we have to work together. We have to mm -hmm. get this one job done. And to see it come to life is like the most amazing thing. Cause it's a wonder of the world watching yeah. the watching the Disney event machine do something that not only are there the most talented people in the business doing it, but it's just what we end up pulling off is, you would never know the struggles we have in the background when you see the end, you know, you see the, 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 the TV show that we put on, or you see the mm -hmm. advertising, or whatever, you'd never realize the struggles that we had. Yeah. But as, as a yeah, it was a, it was a pleasure being involved in that stuff. Um, we, you know, when I, when we were at Shanghai, we were about 10 minutes from the Tron roller coaster. And so at lunch we would bolt down there and uh, we had a buddy of ours that would put us on the Tron coaster. So we got to ride the Tron coaster every day, every day. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, so great. What a, what a great, uh, great experience. Plus, like I said, you, you really did. I worked with some of the most quality uh, people. Um, I actually partner with some of them. Now I work with a group called the magic makers group, which is a bunch of former Disney um, uh, executives. And it's again, all this uh, this level of expertise of people that I work with is when we go in and we help someone be more Disney like and we help people have a better customer service experience. These are people that like change the business that are helping these other people change their businesses. And it's just it's a huge pleasure to, you know, I, like I said, I'm a lucky guy. I get to work with some with some amazing people. And now that I own my own company, I get to choose those people. So I don't have to work oh. for people that drive me crazy anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have to work for dispassionate people. I work for right. people who believe in what they do. And it's just, it's a pleasure, man. All, all across the board. There's a lot of folks who, who like changing plant jobs once in a while, because uh, they just want a new challenge in, in the new industry. They'll go from like, I say, food processing to high tech to yep. back to pulp and paper. And it's that kind of seeking out like-minded people to make the job experience uh, that, yep. much, that much better. It's, it's, it's a really great thing. Actually, my sister-in-law, who is one of my best work friends, her name is Emily Nichols, who you should put on your roster to interview. She is a, a, um, a double engineer, uh, chemical engineering and structure, structural engineer, I believe. And she, she worked on the um, plant floor uh, for Quaker and for things like that. And now she... She basically teaches technical people more human skills and she just, she loves it. It's a really, it's a really perfect niche for her because she's so outgoing. And so she was always that person on the floor that was over enthusiastic and, you know, trying to get p people going and, and, um, and it's just like that. In fact, you know, it only takes one, you get one person right. to be enthusiastic like that. And it's, it's infectious around everybody else. It's, if we all go in, that's why I always say positive thinking and open-minded is really important because it's hard for us to come up with ideas when we're, our brain is in that state. You know, if we start thinking positive, the possibilities are endless. So let's, let's exhaust those possibilities. And then we can, again, we can go back to our ideas and they say them, but at the time, let's just think of as many as we can first before yeah. we go destroying them, <laughs> right. you know? <laughs> Well, and I think actually the people at the leading reliability conference really like that, that the part about, um, I taught about, about cultivation and, and greenhousing. And that is, you know, we have a tendency to naysay ideas right out of the gate and mm -hmm. we think we're being helpful, but if we're together trying to solve a problem, let's just, let's just agree to stay in that abstract space for whatever amount of time. And then we can, after we make that list, then we can make choices after that, but let's not cut the stuff off right as we say it, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't know where it's going to lead to. Yeah, the, the exercise you ran it left an impression on all, on all of our teams. Uh, that we we were put in small groups and told to think of uh, what, what what was it? Uh, how how do you get an elephant to jump out of an airplane? Yeah, was one of them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and one person had to talk about how that was possible. And the other person had to talk about reasons that it was not possible. Um, mm -hmm. And there was there was a real morale drop in the room. Uh, the more all the negativity came out and then yeah. re you reversed it and said, okay, now, now be more positive. And suddenly the whole room started buzzing. And it's crazy that there, I have very good examples of Disney of where, where we overturned that. And then a great story of, if I have just a quick second to tell you yeah, is um, back in, I think it was the late two thousands. We did um, an event called what will you celebrate? And it was basically around bringing your celebration to Disney. And one mm -hmm. of, the things that we did during that um, during that promotion was we gave away a night at the at the castle suite in Cinderella Castle. Oh. Now, if if you were aware, there was never a castle suite at, at Cinderella Castle, and it was because the twenty years that we tried to put a castle suite in there, 
we would always get back from operations, merchandise, whatever, all the reasons that we couldn't do it. We had a whole, like, we had binders full of the reports on reasons from the engineers to whoever telling us how we couldn't do it. Well, we got everybody together at one point. We were like, okay, we need a really big piece for this promotion. We know that we can't do this based on all this stuff. So we're going to put this away now and let's just talk about how we could do it. And we wouldn't let anybody say how we can't because we told them we already have the data there. And yeah. um, we had yeah. two or three sessions. And what, six months later, we had a castle suite. And wow. that was a huge, huge thing to overcome. And actually, it was one of the most popular promotions that we had done. And it always gets a lot, it garners a lot of media, which is the reason that we, we did it. And, the, and we were giving it away. We weren't selling it. So it was mm-hmm. just fun to listen to the people who got the opportunity to do it because it was wow. just such a cool thing. So the, the impossible is possible. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it's hard for you to think about a future state where, you know, that you have achieved that, but you have to actually imagine that future state to, in order to get there, right? And of course, right. all the, you know, all the people who have changed businesses have done that, right? They've imagined a world that we, we're not thinking of yet, right? Right. Well, if, and for everyone listening who has been told no to your reliability program in the past or whatever, whatever <laughs> technology you want to do, uh, you want to put those next meeting you have, tell them, put those binders aside. Like Lee said, we have the data on why it's not possible. Let's focus on what's possible. Yeah, and let's just spend you know let's uh, let's just spend a little bit of time, and and that's what you know. Remember me at the beginning of the session, I did that what I call the how to be's. This is how I'd like you to behave in the next hour, and yeah. I find that when I when I facilitate a group of adults and I say, hey, I would love for you to behave this way. Let's we're gonna put away the naysaying, we're gonna put away this, we're gonna do it later tomorrow, no problem. We'll give you an opportunity to do it, but for for now, we're, let's just let's just be in this space, and it it works. It really works. <laughs> it's worked mm-hmm. for me for the last ten years at least. <laughs> uh. Well, let's let's end with your passion for eclectic music. Uh, what's on your radar these days? Yeah, so uh, my uh, I have a DJ um, I have a DJ feed that I do every week. I started it because it served my own creativity. Because you know my job is to bring creativity and get people out of their creative shells, but I need to also keep fresh input. So I I back in the day when I worked at Future World, I used to host these amazing parties, and I'd always have like nightclub level you know music going on at these parties. And I started bringing my stuff portable. To parties that I didn't, I knew they wouldn't have good music, so I just bring my stuff there. I end up DJing like weddings and stuff like that till about 2007. Uh, but when when COVID hit, I we were stuck in our houses, and I was like, well, I want some creativity, so I bought a DJ controller and I I started messing around with it. And then my buddy was broadcasting on Twitch. He's like, you should do something on Twitch. And so mm-hmm. I started a Friday night DJ show, and it's been two years. So every Friday I, I get together probably about 20 to 40 people of varying walks of life. Um, and I, what I do is I play, um, I play really familiar music in a different way. So I troll the internet for different mixes of different styles of music. And so I will mix together Bollywood music with dubstep music with heavy metal with um, uh, with whatever and I, I basically find a beat to all of it and so it's basically like going to a nightclub but hearing familiar and unfamiliar at the same time so you know I, I preach a lot about getting fresh input so uh, when I invite you to, to join us I want you to kind of shed your purism put that aside and just be <clears throat> open and I tell everybody just dance like nobody's watching right so yeah. a lot of people will put us on in their backyards while they you know, sit around and enjoy the sunset. Um, a lot of folks will do that while they're finishing the rest of their weeks of work or something like that. So uh-huh. it's a really great audience, and it's a it's it's a fun gig. My my wife um, Sarah is our chat moderator. Her uh, her name is Pickles Beats, so she makes sure she keeps the the chat going. And uh, I play you know some trivia graphics in the background and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. Every now and then we have theme nights. So uh, I've had a couple of movie theme nights where I I will play movie soundtracks and like dance house versions of movie soundtracks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of fun. New Year's Eve is always popular because I, I DJ for six hours on New Year's Eve. So I, oh, wow. I basically Happy New Year four different time zones. So that's a lot of fun. So, um, and then also uh, you talked about the Inspiration Report. That is a monthly thing I do with a Disney friend of mine named Sean. And basically we gather together 15 different things happening out in the world in a new innovative way. Mm-hmm. And what I ask is people just come in with an open mind and, and understand the principle behind what they're doing. And maybe they can apply it to what whatever it is they're working on. It's just it's just basically a way to inspire people to think differently. So that's great. Big thing of mine. Well we're gonna put both of those in the podcast notes area, the transcript area. Um and again yeah, nice. Beat Party Magic is a is the weekly dance party from nine to eleven Eastern. And uh the the inspiration report comes out the first Friday of every month. The next one's on June third. 
and uh, they're both on the Twitch on the on uh, on Lee's Twitch channel, uh, yeah. which is what let's see, Twitch.tv slash L E E B E E X L T. What you gonna got? It. I love that. I love. <laughs> I started that was actually I started that with my uh, that was my Xbox handle, and because that was my T-shirt size. Now I'm I'm kind of a three XLT right now, but just, we won't <laughs> tell anybody about that. But uh, yeah, it was an easy way to kind of identify me, and and people like call, you know I'm a big guy, so people like yeah. I'm like a teddy bear, so they they love calling me Lee B for some reason because it's kind of goofy and you know it's it 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 fit. So there you have Lee, it. Lee B X L T. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Lee, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast podcast today you you've hit maintenance reliability you've hit all the disney fans in our audience you've hit the music fans um <laughs> everyone this is how you live a creative life so at least thank you yeah so let's much. do this all right yeah and also i would love to connect with all your listeners too so please uh, send me a linkedin request and anybody who is at the leading reliability conference if you plan on using any of the stuff i talked about please please connect with me i would love to walk you through it i'm, I'm a pay it forward kind of guy so uh just let me know happy happy to do that okay thank you for having me Oh,